Hi guys, uh, Pastor Greg Corcoran here from Battlefield Baptist Church. Uh, pray that this sermon is a blessing, an encouragement, and a challenge to you in your walk with the Lord. Additionally, I just wanted to say that if we here at Battlefield can ever be a blessing to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. And the best way to do that is through our website at battlefieldbaptist.org. Again, I pray this sermon blesses you, encourages you, and uh, that you'll fall more in love with God, more in love with his word, and more in love with people. Ooh, thank you, test, test. Thank you for singing. What a great reminder that God is still God and he's still good each and every day, amen? And uh, he does the fighting for us. That was the great reminder from uh, Gabriel's challenge yesterday that uh, Joshua, when he faces this man, he sees a man with the sword, and he says, are you for us or are you against us? I, I'm God. You, you, who are you for, essentially? And, uh, and uh, Joshua was reminded that God was the one that would take care of Jericho, not him. And a uh, great, great challenge yesterday, men, that if we'll just uh, live a little bit more like that, God will take care of our battles if we'll just trust in him. But it's good to be in the Lord's house. I do want to do this. And uh, man, it, it is so good to see you this morning. And if you're visiting with us, uh, and, and I failed to do this earlier, if you're visiting with us for the first time or the first time in a while, uh, our, our dearly beloved from Roanoke, Virginia over here, good to see you today. And <laughs> bless your heart. We've had, we've had our times, water fights and all. And... Uh, we had some great times back in the day. I don't know what happened. All my hair has gone away and it's turned white, but uh, here we are. And then also, uh, my uh, friends from Rhode Island, and I really mean that. I really enjoyed getting to spend some time with you men yesterday. I know there were a couple others, Ernie, your other son, and uh, that was an encouragement to me to be able to spend time with you guys. And so I appreciate you guys being here. I know you had a great family wedding yesterday. Uh, but if you're here visiting with us for the first time or the first time in a while, I want to encourage you to grab one of our connection cards or you can text the word visitor to the number on the screen and uh, that we might have a record of your visit. Stop by the information desk. We have a gift for you just to say thank you for being here. And I know as we progress and kids are graduating from high school and schools are ending and, and vacations begin to start, but I want to encourage you, do not leave Jesus out of your summer plans, amen? Uh, it is so incredibly important that, you know, we have our plans and then there's God's plan. In fact, I'm looking forward. I'm going to uh, have the uh, opportunity and really the honor. Daniel, thank you for asking me to do it. I'll be speaking at Fresta Valley Christian School uh, um, here in about a week and a half for their last chapel. And uh, that's going to be the message that I bring to the young people is my plans versus God's plans. And make sure that you don't leave God out of your plans. Make sure that he is the first and the foremost of your plans. And, and uh, to that accord, I'm excited to have, as I said, Gabriel and uh, Emma, Aaron, and their children with us this morning. And uh, I've asked Gabriel, and you know what? We were talking about a month ago, and I told him what I was going to. Uh, we were in this series of superheroes, and if you're uh, visiting, we talked about the greatest superhero of all uh, a few weeks ago, and his name is... Jesus, yes, and then on Mother's Day we talked about, really I wanted to talk about just mom across the board, but we, we really kind of broadened it. We talked about the woman from Shunem in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 and, and uh, looked at that story surrounding her life and uh, what a woman of God she was, and so we talked about that. And then last week we talked about Noah, and so uh, as I was talking with uh, Gabriel uh, sometime back, he said, man, that's perfect. I'll, ju I'll jump right in. And so uh, that's exactly what he's going to do. And I know that you're going to be blessed by him. And uh, I will tell you, he is not from Summer Duck. <laughs> he does not have a Remington draw, okay? He has a Romanian draw. Would you put your hands together and welcome Gabriel Aaron? Good morning. Um, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what that meant. Um, but 
was, it was good. It uh, probably was something good. Um, it is a great joy for us to be here this morning. Um, ever since I met with, with Pastor Greg, um, I believe it was um, uh, last summer, uh, we talked a little bit, and um, I, I saw in him a, a special passion for the gospel and the, um, for the proclamation of the gospel. And uh, we were hoping to one day be able to come and meet you guys as well. We, we know that you guys sharpen each other, um, and, and we are hoping that we will see a community here uh, which, that is passionate for the gospel as well. And, and, and it's amazing to be here. Um, so it's a great honor to, to preach, to open the word for all of us this morning, uh, see what the Lord has prepared for us. Um, but we are especially honored to know that um, although we are here for the first time, uh, we can unite together in worship on the grounds that what Christ has done for us on Golgotha. Isn't that amazing? It, it may seem like a small thing that we are here for the first time, we see most of you for the first time, and, and yet we can call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not a small thing. It, it's, it's the grace of God, and we must acknowledge it. Uh, I passed, as Pastor Greg said, uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm here together with my family. Um, we come from Henrico, Virginia, right near Richmond. Um, I am the family ministry pastor at Goodwill Baptist Church there. Um, but for the past several months, the Lord has been compelling us to pursue going to Romania as missionaries and church planters. And this is, in fact, the reason why we are here this morning. Uh, we wanted to share uh, more about our ministry, and we had that opportunity to share during the Sunday school time. Um, if you weren't there and you would like to hear more about our, our journey, uh, we have a table set up. I can see it from here. Uh, we have a table set up. We will be around that table after the service. Please stop by and, and, and ask us whatever questions you may have. Even if you are there and, and still have questions, please stop by. We, we would love to talk to you more. Uh, we also have, this, have the sign-up sheets there. If you want to receive our newsletters and, and pray for us as, as the Lord is guiding us through this journey, uh, please write your name and, and an email address and we'll be happy to add you to our list. And um, also we have some Romanian candy there at the table. Um, if you just want to stop for the candy, you don't even have to pretend that you have a question, okay? Don't, don't, don't make up questions, okay? If you don't have one, just come, just come and grab, grab, grab a candy. I will tell you though, most of the people don't like it. Um, so it's completely on you if you choose to grab one. It may be great. It, it may make you sick. I don't know. Um, but that's, that's completely on you. Um, I started by saying that it's a great joy for us to, to be here this morning and to worship together with you. But you see, the reality is that our worship here in this place is just a fraction of who we are called to be as worshipers in regards with our whole lives. We often live with the impression that who we are as worshipers is mainly defined by who we are here in this building. Because here we sing, and here we pray, and here we teach, and here we preach the Word of God. Here we are welcoming, here we are listening to the Word of God. It's convenient to be defined as a worshiper by who you are here. But the Word of God tells us that we are to worship Him in every instance of our life and in every minute of our life we are called to do everything for the glory of God and that is worship don't miss that so if we are called to worship him every day with everything that we are and everything that we have that means that the time that we spend in the church which is very meaningful the time that we spend in the church uh, uh, it's not just us coming to worship then stopping, going back to our lives, and then next Sunday coming back to worship. No, we are here to continue our worship that started the moment that the Lord saved us and will last uninterrupted until that day about, we, about which we sang about when he will come back, and then we'll worship him for eternity. So if that is the case, willingly or not, we worship something or somebody every second of our lives. And by comparison with the time that we spent here in the church, then what defines us as worshipers is our whole life of worship. Our lives reveal the true object of our worship. A.W. Tozer said that if you don't worship God on Monday, the same way you worshiped him on Sunday, perhaps you don't worship him at all. And they, th that may be a little bit harsh, but, but if that is true that we are called to worship God at school and at work and at home and in the grocery store, if we are called to worship Him just as well as we worship Him here, then we must know what true worship really is, no? 
here in this building and outside when we go to our, to our day-by-day life. So for this reason, we are going to look today at a superhero of faith um, about, uh, for whom worship was central to life. And this is, my, this is the favorite character for me from the Old Testament, and his name is Abraham. And we will not have time to look at, his, uh, at every aspect of his life today, um, but we are going to stop at a passage that truly encapsulates who Abraham was as a worshiper. And we are going to learn this morning that authentic worship is an obedient act of faith based on sacrifice. I'm going to say this again. Authentic worship is an obedient act of faith based on sacrifice. And we are going to read Genesis chapter 22, the first 14 verses. If you would like to stand up for the reading of the text, I will appreciate that. Genesis 22, the first 14 verses. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come back to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that has not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Amen. You can take a seat. We often read this text and we have no clue what to do with it. It's a pretty complicated text, isn't it? Some people think that this is just God playing a shocking prank on Abraham. Other people will think that God is acting outside of his character to ask Abraham to do this unimaginable abomination just to see if he deserves the blessings that he had already promised to him. But you see, in order to understand what truly is going on in this text, we need to look at the context in which this episode takes place. You see, um, during the time of Abraham, As shocking as it may seem, human sacrifice was not that uncommon. Uh, Actually, um, the archaeologists had had, um, discovered a lot of artifacts from the Bronze Age, which is roughly the time in which Abraham lived, um, that represent human sacrifices. And remember, he's from Mesopotamia. He knows these things. He he grew up there. He spent, by this point, most most of his life in Mesopotamia. 
So human sacrifice is perhaps less common, but not completely unexpected. And as Abraham, he knows exactly what he has to do when the Lord tells him to take his son and sacrifice him, and he doesn't object at all to God's request. Instead, he quietly takes his, takes his son and starts this journey. And then in verse 5, the second part, he listens to what he says to, to his servants. I and the lad, talking about Isaac, will go yonder and what? And worship. You see, in Abraham's understanding of what is going on here is that God had called him to worship. And to worship him in a radical way. He's not just going to fulfill an immoral request. That's not in his mind. He thinks he's going to worship God. And I will claim that this is actually a lesson about authentic worship. Yes, it is about obedience. It is about faith. It is about Jesus. We will see all these things. But in all of those, in the context of worship, Abraham is worshiping God in this episode. So if, if this is a lesson about authentic worship, then we must ask some questions this morning. What does my life of worship look like, looking at our superhero faith? What can we learn from Abraham's worship? What even it means to, to um, uh, worship God, and what does authentic worship even look like? And this is the question that we are going to stop at a little bit today. And we are going to try to look through the text and see what does authentic worship look like. And we are going to learn this time from our superhero of faith, Abraham, and the work that God is doing through his life. And the first lesson that we, that we learn here is that authentic worship requires radical obedience. Authentic worship requires radical obedience. Abraham was called by God when he was on his way out of Mesopotamia, and God called him to, be, to become a follower of him, and Abraham becomes a follower of God, obedient in everything that God asks him to do. We arrive at the famous uh, passage in, in Genesis chapter 12, and we see there God asking Abraham to give up his very identity. We see that God is asking him to give up his country, to give, us, give up his family, and give up his inheritance. That is his whole identity. And he says that if he will give up his identity for God, for the sake of God, God will give him a whole new identity. See the name change from Abraham to Abraham. And Abraham does so without complaint because he trusts God in obedience. When God tells him, Abraham, get up and go there, Abraham goes there. And when God tells him, Abraham, get up and come here, Abraham comes here. And if renouncing on his whole identity was not already radical enough, we arrive at this chapter and we see God asking even more of Abraham to renounce on the thing that he loves the most, on his son Isaac, for the sake of God. This is a radical request. It requires radical obedience. And Abraham does not disappoint. See, it, it is, it is fa fascinating to me how Abraham doesn't complain at all about this. Because we know from other passages that Abraham can be a very opinionated man. If you remember in Genesis chapter 18, God comes to Abraham and, and, and he stops by and, and he tells him, Hey, I'm on my way to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But the thing is, in Sodom... Abraham, Abraham had family. Lot was there with his family. And he estimates, okay, there perhaps are about 50 people by now. And then he says, God, wait, 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 wait. Don't go yet. What if there are 50 righteous people in Sodom? Are you still going to destroy it? And God says, no, I'm not going to destroy it then. And then Genesis 18 says that Abraham thought a little bit more. And he was like, maybe five, maybe five of them are missing. Maybe, maybe they are traveling. We, it seems like we all have that, that relative, that extended family. They always travel. You work hard, and then you, you, you have it in your calendar I, I, six months until the vacation. And, and your, that relative of yours, he always posts pictures of, about nice travels that they take. Abraham seems to, seems to have those relatives. So he's thinking, maybe, maybe, maybe these five are traveling. So he tells God, what if there are only 45? And God says, if there are 45 people, with righteous people there. I'm not going to destroy Sodom. And then Abraham thinks more and he says, what if there are 40? What if there are 30? What if there are 20? What if there are 10? All of this because he has a different opinion than God on that. 
He even, he even tries to give God a moral lesson. He says at some point in, in Genesis 18, you cannot destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. He's teaching God what will be moral of his nature to do. And now God tells him, take your son, your only son whom you love, and sacrifice him for me. And Abraham says, here I am, I'm going to do it. That's amazing. That is radical obedience. Although Abraham is ready to die for his family a few chapters earlier, and he loves his son more than his own life, he still loves God more. And he's ready to obey him. Radical obedience is when we renounce on ourselves in radical ways for the sake of God. It is not only when we, when we think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God in front of my job, so I'm going to refuse to work on Sundays. That's great. Or I'm going to put God in front of my school. I'm going to refuse to do homework on Sunday. Uh, that, that you, probably, probably you were just using that as an, as a, as an argument not to do homework. But still, um, but, but we often have these areas. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God before this area. But you see, radical obedience is more than that. It's when we put God before our whole existence. When we are ready to destroy the things that we love most in our lives. When we are ready to give up our very lives for the sake of God. When we are, are ready to scatter the dreams that we have been investing many years into. Just for the sake of God. When we are ready to put on the altar the things that we are most proud of. And the things that make us most happy in this life. And burn them to ashes. For the sake of God. Because the... This is the very type of sacrifice that God asked for from Abraham. Authentic worship requires radical obedience. And when I read this text, I cannot help but wonder, is there anything radical in the way I worship God every day? How far am I ready to go with God on this? When will, when will be that time when I, will, when I will tell God, you know what, I don't think so. Is that when he will ask me for my family? Is that when he will ask me for my job? When he will ask me for my money, for my car, for my own pride? When will I say, no, that, that's too much, I cannot do that? When will, when will you say no to God? How far are you ready to go and how radically are you ready to obey God and worship him? Because if there is nothing radical in the way we worship God every day, brothers and sisters, this text is bad news to us. Because this is the very kind of worship that God expects from us every day. God is a jealous God and he will not share us with anything or anybody. He wants us wholly dedicated to him. In Romans chapter 12, Apostle Paul was saying, Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, or how other translations will put it, your true worship. Brothers and sisters, if you want to seek authentic worship, then offer yourself to God every day. Start your day by thinking, God, I am here. Here I am. What do you want me to do today? How do you want me to worship you today? Because that is the worship that God expects from us. The second thing that we are going to we are going to look at today is that authentic worship is based upon covenantal faith. Authentic worship is based upon covenantal faith. We look at our, our character, our, our superhero this morning, and we look at his obedience, we look at his strength, we, and, and, and we think, I wish I was like Abraham. I just, I can't. He's Abraham, I am I. Okay, there is, a, there is a huge difference between us. But I will argue this morning that Abraham is not so special in himself. Although we call him a superhero, he is not a superhuman. He doesn't have some, some superpowers that you and I don't have today. He doesn't. I mean, just think for a second what kind of a husband Abraham was. When he felt like he was in danger, he put his wife in danger by claiming that she was his sister and not his wife. And he did it twice. Even in this episode, we see Abraham taking 
Isaac, his son, and, and taking him to sacrifice him, and he tells nothing to his wife. Perhaps none of us will do that to our wives. We know that uh, husbands and, and fathers and even grandparents, we know that taking a decision regarding the kids without first consulting our wives, it's a big no-no. <laughs> no? It, it, it is. Um, but I'm not even talking here about the three-day trip. Abraham takes a three-day trip with Isaac. And he's not expecting that, that it's going to be a very nice trip. And yet he doesn't tell anything to his wife. Perhaps neither of us will do that to our spouses. Some of us out of respect, maybe others out of, out of fear of trouble, but none of us probably will do that. Abraham was a man just like us, with the same weaknesses and, 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 and with the same temptations that sin has brought in each one of, of us. So then we need to raise the question, what made Abraham so strong? Why do we look at him today and we think he's a superhero of faith? And even the New Testament calls him a hero of faith. What's going on in Abraham's life? And I will claim that the answer to this question is that he had a better approach to life than most of us have today. You see, Abraham's success did not have to do with his own value. But it, has, it had to do with him understanding the value of God. He understood the value of God. Isaac was not only Abraham's only son, but he was also the agent of God's promise to Abraham. Remember that promise that Abraham gave up his whole identity for. So it seems like Abraham, by losing his son, he will not only use his only son, but he will also, only legitimate son, I will say, but he will also lose the promise of God that he built his whole life upon now. But Abraham doesn't see things that way. There is something very strange in the way Abraham approaches this episode. You see, it seems like Abraham didn't expect that God will stop him for sacrificing Isaac. But then at the same time, he tells his servants in verse 5 that him and Isaac will come back. So then at the same time, he, he expects that he will come back with Isaac. How is that possible? What's going on in Abraham's mind? Is, is he under so much stress that, it's kind of, that he's kind of losing it? It's either or or the other. That, that would be the natural way of looking at it, no? But then if we go to the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, we find out what's going on in Abraham's mind through this journey. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham... When he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God, pay attention now, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You see, according to the author of Hebrews, Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, and he thought that he was going to sacrifice him. But at the same time, he knows for sure, he's certain that he will come back with Isaac, even if that will mean that Isaac will be resurrected. And he was right. Before he saw any resurrection, before he heard anything about the Messiah that, that will come and bring salvation and, and uh, uh, assure us of our resurrection, before he heard anything about these things, he believed in God because he believed in the promises of God. This is, this is uh, um, covenantal faith. Abraham had faith that once God made a covenant with him, there is no way that he will pull out. Abraham had faith that once, once God made a promise to him, he promised that he would bless him immensely in Abraham. There was no way that God would change his mind. Even if that would mean to, that God will do something completely unexpected, completely unheard of. Because God doesn't change. Because God is faithful. Because God cannot deny himself. That is covenantal faith. To look at who God is and he, he who revealed himself to be in his word. And to trust that he is what he said he is. And he will do what he said he will do. Abraham's worship was based upon covenantal faith. 
God had promised through his covenant, and no matter how unlikely that seemed at this time, no matter how unlikely that seemed, he had faith that God will come true. This is the faith that God expects from all of us. Regardless of how unlikely it may seem today, that God is in control of your life or in control of your circumstances, have faith in God. Because he promised that he's going to lead you in every step. And he promised that he is sovereign over your life. Regardless of of how hard your life may seem at this very moment in, in time, have faith in God because he promised that he will take away your burden. Regardless of how far away God may seem from you this very day or maybe, or maybe other times, regardless of how lonely you may, you may feel, have faith in God because he promised that he will be with us to the end of the days. Have faith in God. Have faith that once he made a covenant with you, he will keep it. And all his promises will stand forever. And we, we will live waiting for that day when, when, when his last promise will fulfill, that he will come back to take us with him. Amen. Have faith in God. Only when our lives are marked by covenantal faith in God, only then we'll be able to worship him in every circumstance of our lives. That's the key to worshiping God, even when things go wrong. Have faith in Him. Do you have faith in God based on His promises? Do you have faith in God based on His word? I pray that you do. The third thing that we are going to look at, the last thing, authentic worship is centered on sacrifice. Authentic worship is centered on sacrifice. When we think of uh, of worship, often we think of something that that, uh, um, we will receive by worshiping. We, we are recharged. We receive some power. And, and, and in, to some extent, that is correct. But it, more important than that, more important than us receiving something through worshiping God is the sacrifice that makes worship possible. I will claim that worship after the fall, beginning with the fall, worship has always been a, a cha- centered on sacrifice. Worship has always been centered on sacrifice. We're going to live a little bit the realm of Christianity and we are going to look a little bit of uh, the religions or the world religions around us. And if you look at most of them, you will see that they have some sort of sacrifice at their center. And although, sadly, those sacrifices are, are wrongly oriented towards non-existent gods, there is an important proof that by design, Humans have, have this in, 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 their, in their conscience that a sacrifice will be needed to receive the grace of God after the fall. That's interesting. You see, most world religions believe that, that some sacrifice will ultimately save one from death. A death that they will claim the gods are entitled to ask for. Now we come back to Christianity. And we look through the Old Testament and we see sacrifice all over the place. After the fall, we see sacrifice. After the flood, we see sacrifice. After the promise made to Abraham, we see sacrifice. After the exodus, we see sacrifice. After the giving of the law, we see sacrifice. After the conquering of Canaan, we see sacrifice. At every single major moral reform, every single major feast, every single major transition through the history of Israel, we see sacrifice. Sacrifice is at the center of worship through the Old Testament. And I will claim this morning that sacrifice is at the center of worship in the New Testament as well. And I will explain that. See, we often think that God simply changed his mind in regards with Isaac. He allowed Abraham to take all this this trip, this terrible three days. Can you imagine what was in Abraham's mind in these three days? He allowed him to take these three days. He allowed him to build the altar, to lift up the knife. And then he stops him the last second and changes his mind. But that's not, that's not really what happened. You see, Isaac was required to die in God's economy. And God will not change his mind in regards with that. What God will change is the object of sacrifice. God didn't just stop Abraham, but he also offered another sacrifice, sacrifice instead of Isaac. Let's look again at verses 13, uh, uh, actually verses 12 through 14. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, 
Neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld his, thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of, the, of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen or it shall be provided. What is very interesting here in verse 13, the Hebrew language behind our English translation says that Abraham saw another ram. Not just a ram, another ram. And that seems to suggest that Isaac was the first ram, he was the first sacrifice, but God provided another Isaac to be sacrificed instead of him. It was a life for life exchange. It was a substitution. It was God in his grace providing somebody else to die instead of Isaac. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah. If that doesn't, I, I, some of you said yes, but if that doesn't sound familiar to, mo to most of you, let me add something else. Do you know where this altar is being built? The Old Testament tells us that later on this very mountain where the altar is, Jerusalem will be built. Moreover, the text seems to suggest that the ram was not just behind Abraham, very close, but there is some distance implied in there. Look at the language that is being used. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. This is a contract, a contract verb that we see a lot through the Old Testament. We also see it in in verse 4, when Abraham lifted up his eyes and looks ahead and he sees the place from a distance. And consistently through the Old Testament, there is a distance implied here. And then he says that, that Abraham went and took the ram. Another compound verb here. And verbs are very, very intentional in Hebrew. So Abraham had to go, pick up the ram, and then come back and sacrifice the ram. And according to the customs of how altars will be built through the Old Testament and the direction that they will have, it is likely, we don't know for sure, but it is likely that this hill behind where the ram was, was actually the hill later called Golgotha. And if that is true, that means that Abraham had to go the very same way on, on the path later called Via Dolorosa. He had to go, pick up the ram, and come back and sacrifice him instead of Isaac on the same path or a similar path that Jesus took to, to carry his cross and die for us. Does that ring a bell? Let me add something else here. Look at how Abraham called the place. The mount of the Lord, it shall be seen or it shall be provided. That's the, that's the meaning of the word seen there. Now, Abraham is probably referring to the fact that God provided a substitute for Isaac, but he called the place with a future note. And then for centuries, the people of God will, count, will, will call this mountain the mount on which the Lord shall provide. And on this very mountain rage, that we know for sure, on this very mountain rage, 2,000 years later, Christ will die for you and I instead of you and I because the Lord had provided. He had provided a substitute for you and I. When God showed the ram to Abraham, he didn't simply point towards a ram, but he pointed towards Jesus. Stuck on the cross between thorns, dying so that you and I, the descendants of Isaac, as we are called in the New Testament, will live and not die. This is the sacrifice that is the, at the center of the New Testament. Brothers and sisters, there is no authentic worship without Christ at its center. Yeah. If you want to worship God authentically every day of your life, live a Christ-centered life. Live in the light of what Christ has done for us on the, on the cross. Don't allow this reality to slip your mind even for a second. Remember that it's only through the sacrifice of Christ that you and I can even worship God. And it's such a grace that we can worship Him every day. And we are called to do it. If you are here this morning and you are not at peace with God, if you are here and you don't worship God, first of all, I'm very glad that you are here. And, and although I'm just visiting, I, I'm sure that you're welcome to come back anytime. No? Yeah. 
But I must beg you this morning. Allow Christ to be your substitute as well. He didn't only die for Isaac. He didn't only die for me. He didn't only die for members of the church. He died for you as well. And if you put your faith in Christ, and if you believe that he died, so then you will not die based on the sin that you are carrying. If you believe that he took away the sin on Golgotha and that he, and then his blood that was spilled on the cross cleanses you from every sin and you are seen as righteous before God. If you believe these things, he's your substitute as well. He's your salvation as well. I hope that you will have the strength to believe in him this morning. Abraham, our hero of, of faith, is a great example of authentic worship which we said it is an act of obedience, an, act of, an obedient act of faith based on sacrifice. We're all called to worship God every day. And I pray, I want to close with this prayer that Battlefield Baptist Church, every person in this church will faithfully worship God every day. And that your worship will be characterized by radical obedience, covenantal faith, and Christ unshakably at its center. Amen. Come on. Uh, Gabriel, thank you for that message. Praise the Lord. I, I want us to do this. Let's bow our heads and our eyes as we enter into a quiet time of invitation. Here in just a minute, I'll ask you to stand as we just sing a song of praise back to the Lord and recognition that he is still God. He's worthy of our authentic worship. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful reminder from Scripture today of this from one of God's uh, really chosen vessels that God used so long ago. And the illustration in the text still speaks to our hearts and our lives today. Maybe you're here, as Gabriel mentioned. Maybe you're sitting there and you're like struggling with this. You're, you're looking for peace. Maybe you've looked for peace. You've, you've, you've sought peace in so many different directions. You've been looking for love in so many directions, hoping for happiness and hoping for joy, only to be left wanting. Can I tell you, Jesus is all that you need. As he said, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, he has provided the sacrifice in our place so that you might not only be forgiven of your sin, but that we could know based on that faith that we would have a home in heaven. You say, Pastor, would you just pray for me? Would you pray for me this morning? I've, I've never trusted Christ, but I just, I'm asking you to pray for me that I would have that strength that Gabriel mentioned, that I would call out upon the name of the Lord by faith today and that I would ask him to come into my life and to begin to change me from the inside out would you just look at me and say pastor pray for me this morning that's all I'm asking I see you bless your heart someone else say pray for me that I would have strength today that I would take that step of faith just catch my attention please it's so important this is the most important decision that you would ever make today maybe you say pastor would you pray for me today that my worship would be authentic? That I would actually, each and every day, buy up the opportunity that God gives me to worship Him. And that I would, I would seek to do that more diligently. Would you look at me and say, Pastor, pray for me today that I would, I would take up that, that wonderful opportunity to worship God, not just on Sunday, but as even the A.W. Tozer quote said, that we would worship him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and every day. Would you say, Pastor, pray for me that I would worship him that way? Yes, I see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see faces. God bless you. Get my attention. God bless you. God bless you. I see you, young lady. Bless your heart, brother. Somebody else. I want to worship God. I see the example that God has left for me, and I want to. I see you back there. Bless your heart. Somebody else. Say, pray for me. Pray for me. Yes, yes. Father, you've seen the hearts, you've seen the hands, and Lord, we thank you for your word. 
we know that it's your word and the wooing of the Holy Spirit that changes lives. And so, Lord, we're thankful that your word has been declared today. We're thankful for the messenger that came and shared this message with us. Lord, I pray that now in the quietness of this moment, that your children, your children and, and this one dear lady who is, is sitting here contemplating her decision, Lord, that you would work in her heart. She would, that she would call out upon the name of the Lord as your word says. She would just say, Lord, I need you right now. I need you to come into my heart and my life. I need you to forgive me. I need you to come in and do a work that only you can do. And Lord, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And Lord, I'm trusting you today as the Lord and Savior of my life. Lord, help me to live from this day forward in a way that brings you honor and glory. God, I pray that that would be the example of worship of all of us. That we would live our lives recognition of who you are what you have done and what you will do whether we're on the mountaintop whether we're in the valley or we're in the in between times of life Lord that you would receive the glory for it Father I pray that you encourage hearts today that you will challenge us as we even leave this place that you will be made much of each and every day of our lives give you the praise for what you and you alone have done and what you and you alone can do. We ask it in the precious and powerful name of your son, Jesus, and for his sake, amen.